Welcome to the next episode of Rambam Hilchot Teshuvah and we've now got the second part continuing from last week of chapter 6 and we'd like to dedicate this episode in memory of Elisheva Yael by Leah Valevi and also Binyamin Ben Moshe Ve'ester Roh Hashem Tanachinu Megal Eden over to Michael Thank you Rabbi Kalati <coughs> So we're going to continue now with Halacha 3. But just to recap uh, what we talked about a little bit earlier in the Perek, uh, we talked about <coughs> the concept of how if you, do, um, uh, if you do repentance, then it is considered like body armour to you, spiritual body armour. Um, and But now we're going to talk about how um, there are certain instances where really severe transgressions will be punished by you losing your right to uh, to effect to shuva, which is in itself a great punishment. Because if there's no way back for you, in fact, if you're caught in a loop that you can't get out of, that must be a terrible, terrible thing. But these are uh, transgressions committed by the likes of people like Pharaoh, as we are soon to see, is an example of this of an instance where such a such a person would be um, repentance would be withheld. So Halacha three Gadol and it's possible the man should consider one uh, grievous sin or or many sins um, so that the judge of truth, this is how Rambam talks, uh, um, names Hashem in this instance, judge of truth will decree that against him, w- this this sinner committed sins of his own free will and conscious and with his own conscience. Repentance would be withheld from him altogether for his transgressions and grant him no leave to repent so that he might die and perish in the iniquity that he committed. Um, this is when Yeshayahu was told to rebuke Bnei Yisrael, uh, and this is what Hashem said through Yeshaya: Make the hearts of the people fat, make their eyes heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and understanding with their hearts will return and be healed. This is, you know, strict punishment. You know, even Bnei Yisrael can be unfortunately worthy of this retribution but we are going to see soon it's more it's it's for the likes of pharaoh and the, and the such like and it is more over said um, this is Hashem saying, but they mocked the messengers of Hashem who were rebuking them and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of Hashem rose against his people till there was no remedy. This we see in Chronicles 36.16. Kaloma, as if to say, that they sinned of their own free will and they had multiplied their iniquities until their guilt carried the punishment to withhold repentance from them, which is the remedy. As it is therefore written in the Torah, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Uh, because at the beginning, Pharaoh sinned of his own free will, and he meted out evil to Israel who sojourned in his land. So in the beginning, Pharaoh was guilty for simply for hating, persecuting B'nai Yisrael, just for being Jews and just for living in Egypt. Shneema, as it says in Shemot chapter Aleph, Hava hanich kama lo. Come, let us deal wisely with them. Therefore, justice was uh, withheld 
Justice demanded that repentance be withheld from Pharaoh so that his due punishment might be visited upon him. See, Pharaoh, as you know, when I was learning this, I was struck by a comparison between this phrase, Hava nis chakama, come let us deal wisely with them. So this was the level of wickedness that Pharaoh used in order to persecute Bnei Israel, where he devised plans and drew up uh, long-term plans um, to, to figure out how to... This wasn't just an act of anger. This was premeditated, cold-blooded persecution, the likes of which we saw in with the Nazis, who over a period of 10, 10 12 years, slowly drip-fed propaganda to the population about how bad the Jews were. This, this same sort of div, uh, devising of plans, come, let us deal wisely with them, shows cold-blooded premeditation. And this was the evil that, you know, Pharaoh was ex- exceptionally evil towards Bnei Israel. And this is why the possibility of repentance, perhaps he could have repented, he was given the opportunity to repent, but he was, no, he was a sly, sly ruler who Hashem was so, got so angry with that he took away the concept of Teshuvah and really made him eat himself, basically. <clears throat> so, and Rambam continues. The Fichach Chizuk Chizek HaKadosh Baruch Hu Et Libo. So uh, th- this is why Hashem hardened his heart. And if so, why did he delegate Moshe to him, charging him to let Israel go forth and turn to repentance, seeing that Hashem, blessed be he, long since told him that um, he will not let you go. Uh, saying, but as for thee and thy servants, I know you will not fear Hashem. Um, and again saying, but in the very deed for this cause have I made thee to stand, to show my power, and that my name be declared throughout all of earth. To kedei lihodi leovei haolam shebizman shemone hakadosh baruch hu hu ishtavu lachote eno yachol lashuv to demonstrate to the future generations whenever Hashem blesses he withholds repentance from a sinner he cannot repent ella yamut burish o sheasa batchela brutzono but he must die in his own original evil which he perpetrated of his own free will. Uh, and um, it is also Sihon, um, by the measure of his iniquity, became guilty of an offence which carried the punishment to have repentance withheld from him. Uh, Sihon was the king of the Amorites. He was mentioned in, um, uh, in I think it was in Bamidbar. Um, he was, he was uh, vanquished by Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, he was a, one of the giants. There was Sichon, there was Og. Um, yeah, that's, that's him in context. Okay. Shenem um, as it says in Devorim, Ki hiksha Hashem alakecha et ruchu v'yamet et levavo. For the Lord, thy God, hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. V'chein hakna'anim l'fi to'avotehem v'ana mehem hatshuva ad she'asu melchama im Yisrael. Um, likewise, the Canaanites, according to their abominations, also Hashem withheld repentance for them so that they engaged Israel in battle. And this must have been infuriating because perhaps Pharaoh or Sihon, these people suddenly realized that they'd got themselves into something serious. Hashem was delivering retribution and they were still, they couldn't get out of this thing of refusing mm. to release Bnei Israel in terms in Pharaoh's case. So he may have said, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to get out of this. I want to yeah. let him go, but no, his heart wasn't wouldn't allow him to. So yeah. it must have been, you know, he was fulfilling God's predestination for uh, for his punishment, and it must have been a, a real curse to not to be able to get out of the situation, you know, because at one point maybe he's seen what's going on. There's plagues devastating Egypt, but he can't let go of this concept of not letting these people go. 
Um, and Rambam continues. Shenema uh, in Yoshua chapter 11. Ki ma'et Hashem ha'ita lechazek et libam lekuat ha'melchama im Yisrael l'ma'an ha'charimam. As it is said, for it was of Hashem to harden their hearts to come against Israel in battle that they may utterly, they may be utterly destroyed. So Hashem is like playing with them, bringing them into a battle, uh, even though they may not, they may realize they're on the losing side already. And also was so um, in the days of Elisha. Um, because of the uh, multiple iniquities, sins that were that were um, that they were withheld from um, doing repentance from for the evil doers. I think I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but Bnei Israel were sinning to such an extent where they were uh, repentance was withheld from them too. Shenelma, as it says in Malachim chapter Aleph, Ve'ata hatibot et libam achronit. Um, thou, that you did turn your heart backwards. Kaloma mana ata mehen hatshuva, as if to say that you, the Hashem, withheld repentance from them. Nimtza ata omer shlo gaza ha'el al paro laharal Yisrael v'lo al sichon lachote be'atzo v'lo al haknaanim v'hat aiv v'lo al Yisrael la'avod avod zara. And thus, as a consequence, we must say that Hashem's predestination prompted not for Pharaoh to wrong Israel, nor Sichon to sin in his land, nor the Canaanites to be abominable, abominable nor Israel, B'nai Israel, to worship idolatry. It was their choice. As it says, It was, they all sinned at their own free will and accords, and therefore they were all guilty of an offence which carried along the punishment to withhold repentance from them. So it was their original will to sin which prompted God's refusal uh, of um, allowing them to repent, which ultimately caught them in a loop they couldn't get out of. Um, and, they con- and we continue with Halacha 4. Okay, inyan ze sho'alin ha-tzadikim ba-anviyim ba-tfilatam me'et Hashem la'azram al ha'emet. On this subject, the righteous and the prophets supplicate and pray that the Hashem may help them to discover the truth. David Hashem And as King David said, Teach me thy way, O Lord, that I may walk in thy truth. Kaloma al Yamnaunu Emet Shemecha. And he continues, King David says, Let not my sins withhold the way of truth by which I may discover thy will and the oneness of thy name. Um, uh, and likewise, this verse says, uh, Restore unto me the joy of salvation. Um, uh, and uh, and also saying, grant, grant leave to my spirit to do thy will, and let not my sins be a cause to withhold repentance from me, but let the power be in my hands until I, I will turn and understand and know the true way. So, um, <clears throat> basically, we're talking about genuine repentant people who are now saying, look, I, I know I've sinned, but please, God, show me your ways. Show me how I can repent. You know, please uh, um, enlighten me as to what I should be doing. So these are genuine people who, King David, who said, just show me the way and I will repent as much as I can, you know, for you. Um, and th- this is interesting. These are genuine people who want, to, uh, who want to repent. But I want to mention something that is in this uh, commentary of Rabbi Abraham, um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Abramson, who talks about the concept of fatigue, teshuva fatigue. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. 
I'll, I'll quote from his book. Teshuvah is a commandment that admits of no surrogate. It is highly personal and cannot be performed adequately without complete commitment. It can be exhausting and even depressing. According the process, accordingly, the process tends to produce a phenomenon of teshuvah fatigue, where the penitent despairs of effecting any real change and the impetus for movement loses immediacy. The constant inward focus self-analysis is draining and in our exhaustion we enter into a thousand little rebellions against ourselves and the system that demands our teshuvah. You know, I'm sure that all of us in performing teshuvah have, have, have had this visited upon us where we think, well, you know, this is too difficult, I can't do this or... Um, or, 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 or this is not making an effect. And he continues, it's counterintuitive when our spiritual lassitude may actually serve as an indication that we're making progress. Inner resistance suggests that we are pushing up against the barrier of our past behaviours, that we may have reached a point where so many times before we have thrown up our hands in despair and turned back. It is right here, right now, that we have the opportunity with just a tiny little push to extend the reach of our self-control, planting our flag just a little bit further along in this uncharted territory. So, um, you know, we must be aware that sometimes we should not lose hope when we're performing Teshuvah. It reminds me of when I used to go swimming a lot. Yeah. And I used to, I used to go every day during the week. And uh, it's like every few weeks I would hit a wall and I would walk into... You shouldn't into... swim too near to the start of the pool then. <laughs> no, exactly. My goggles were fogging up. <laughs> no. This is, I used to turn up at the gym and I used to walk towards my locker and before even putting the key in the door, I was thinking, I can't do it. I haven't got the strength to turn the key to open my locker. Mm -hmm. How am I going to do like 30 lengths in the pool? And I said, and each time I would say to myself, you've got to do this. This is like a benchmark. Because what used to happen was I used to be, I never used to turn back and go home. I used to just do it. And I found that after that session, the next time I go swimming, I was like 20% faster swimming because of that benchmark thing so what you've got to realize even in Teshuvah you're not you don't reach a wall you're not at the base of the wall you're at the top of the wall you've climbed the wall you just have to get your leg over and reach the next plateau so that's so when you when people are doing Teshuvah and thinking there's not having an effect imagine you're not up against the base of the wall you're up against that sort of edge that you you can scramble onto the next ledge and you've set yourself a new standard. You've strengthened yourself through adversity. Halakha 5. Omahu zesh amad David tov yashah Hashem alken yorech ata'im baderech. But what is this talking about that King David said, good is upright, good and upright is Hashem. Therefore, ken yorech ata'im baderech. Therefore, does instructors does he instruct sinners in the way? Yaderech anavim, he guides the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. So we rely on Hashem to help us in our, you know, if we're genuine, Hashem will gladly show us the way and enable us to involve ourselves in circumstances that seemed unlikely, but they are there to uh, allow us to. Do to Shabbat. We have to be genuine. And my mom continues. This is a reference to the prophets who are sent to make the ways of Hashem known and to turn the people to repentance. Moreover, he endowed with them a power to study and understand. And it is the tendency of every man to pursue wisdom and righteousness as long as he is trained in the ways of wisdom. Uh, this is in harmony with what our Rabbonim, or blessed memory, said. He who comes to be cleansed receives aid. As it is said, he will find himself aided in the matter he strives after. So again, if we're genuine and we want to make Teshuvah, Hashem will 
gladly help us and 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 make opportunities arise where you know it, so that we can affect our own to shove up but we've got to take the first step and um continues and what we talk about predestination um it, it is quoted know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in uh, a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they sh- and they shall afflict them hare geze al hamitsrim la sot ra is this not, is this a decree against the Egyptians to do evil? Um Kayom Haam Haze Vazana Achare Eloke Neche Haaretz. And it is also written, and this people will rise up and go astray after the foreign gods of the land. Is this predestination? Are all these pro are these prophetic words do they are they edicts against us that we must fulfil the book, so to speak? Also, it is said there's a decree against Israel to worship idolatry. Then why would you? Why would Hashem visit retribution? If He's saying that this will happen, that will happen, that will happen, why? How can you punish them? Because he's, he's, they're just fulfilling a prophecy. Because he did not decree that the particularly known person shall be the one to go astray. For every individual uh, who, um, who did not go astray to worship idolatry, had he not done so to worship of his own free will, he would not have worshipped. So in other words, he, there may be instances where uh, things are foretold, but it doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, you don't say because it's written that way, I must become that way, or it's an excuse to be that way. If it's foretold, it's a general foretelling, so to speak, but it doesn't mean you have the choice. Uh, you know, you have the choice. You you can't say I'm only following orders, so to speak. Um, and Hashem made known uh, no more than the customs of the world. You know, like he says, there will be poor in the world, there will be righteous in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to be poor if it just says there are poor in the world. This is like when one says, amongst the people will be righteous and wicked. Not because of this will the wicked one say that it had been long since decreed that he should be an evildoer, seeing that Hashem made it known to Moses that there will be wicked people amongst Israel. Or like it says on the, the, the subject of poverty, um, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Uh, likewise, the Egyptians, if each and every one of those who vexed and wronged Israel had no desire to wrong them, he had it in his power to refrain from doing so. For he did not decree against a particular man, but made it known to Avraham that in the end his seed would be enslaved in a land which is not theirs. O kova amranu she en koach ba adam le yade ha ech yade ha kodesh baruchu devarim ha atidim le tios. But we have already stated that it's not within the power to comprehend the full knowledge of the of Hashem. So he's saying, Baba is saying, look, Hashem has made statements about what will come come to pass. That people will be poor in the land. That your the Avraham told Avraham that the people of Israel will be slaves in us in the future. It doesn't mean anybody has to be committed to that path, and it's not an excuse to say, "Oh, you know what? 
I was told, Hashem told me that we would be like this one day. So you know what? I am submit to, to the plan. It's not true. Each one of us can write our own destiny. And we, Hashem wants us to write our own destiny in the, to the, its best way. Fantastic. And that concludes. Mm-hmm. Very good. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you very much. So uh, we're looking forward next time we convene to uh, the seventh Perek of this exciting um, series on uh, Hilchot Shuvah. Uh, we hope we've inspired you, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time.